So, we are finished the 17th mantra of the first chapter, second section. Now, we are on the 18th mantra and the 18th mantra is where the teaching actually begins. So, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, teaching actually began only after one chapter and ten slokas. Here also, teaching actually begins only in the middle of the second section. So we'll chant that, please unmute yourself. This is the 18th mantra of the second section. Na jayate mriyate va vipaschit Na jayate mriyate va vipaschit Nāyam kutaschinna bhabhuva kaschit Nāyam kutaschinna bhabhuva kaschit Ajo nitya sāśvato yam purāna ha. Ajo nitya sāśvato yam purāna ha. Na hanyate hanya māne sarīre. Na hanyate hanya māne sarīre. Okay, so some parts of it appear familiar of this mantra. Yes. Where did we see it first? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita. So, mm. I think when we discussed there in Chapter 2, I told you that those are not original teachings. They're all from the Upanishad only. So, it's borrowed from this section. Now, let's look at what it means. So, I am Vipaschita. So, Vipaschita will explain in detail. You can take it as this all-knowing one. I am Vipaschita, the all-knowing one. Na jayate does not originate, is not born. Va mriyate, so you have to add there, va na mriyate, and does not die. Na babhuva, the so babhuva is to come or, or, or originate. So it does not come from kutaschita, from anything. And na babhuva, it does not become anything. So it does not originate from anything and does not become anything. I am Ajaha. This Atma is birthless. Nityaha, eternal. Shashwataha, without decay. Puranaha. A Purana has a very special meaning which I had explained in the Bhagavad Gita when we came across this sloka. Do you remember what the meaning was? The literal meaning is Purana is old. But what, what was the meaning we gave it? Also fresh, mm. ever fresh. Ever fresh. So old and ever fresh, which means it does not grow at all. Na hanyate, it is not killed. Charire hanyamane, when the body is killed. So you'll see the mild differences there between the two mantras in the Bhagavad Gita and over here. So there's kadachit instead of kutaschit. And as I said, the Gita, Krishna has borrowed from the Upanishad. Upanishad is the original Shruti. And here, Yamraj is answering the question which Nashiketas had asked. What, what was the question? Is there anything, any Atma, which survives the death of this body? And this question he answers. Yamraj answers. Yamraj is the Acharya, the teacher. He answers over the next eight verses. So up to verse number 25, you will find that Yama talks about Atma Swarupa, the nature of the Atma, Atma Swarupa Jnanam, knowledge about the nature of the Atma, Atma Swarupa Jnana Sadhanam, the discipline to be followed to gain that knowledge of the Atma, and Atma Swarupa Jnana Phalam. 
the benefits of knowing the Atma. So four topics are going to be covered. Atma Swarupaha, nature of the Atma. Atma Swarupa Jnanam, knowledge of the nature of the Atma. Atma Swarupa Jnana Sadhanam, the disciplines necessary to be undertaken to get this Atma Swarupa Jnanam and Atma Swarupa Jnana Phalam, the benefits of getting that Jnana. The Atma Swarupam is the nature of consciousness. This nature of consciousness we have defined several times during the earlier, earlier studies, both in Bhagavad Gita, in Tattva Bodha, as well as in Mundaka Upanishad. What are they? The five features of consciousness, what are they? Anybody? Sat, Chit, Anand, Nama, Swarup. No, no, no. Five features of consciousness. Not the part, property, or the product of the body. Correct. It's uh, it pervades and enlivens the body. Yes. It needs the body as a reflective medium to yeah. uh, manifest it. Yes. Manifest. Uh, it's uh, it survives after the body is uh, gone. Decay yes. of the body. Yeah. Okay. So in short, those are the features, those five features we talked about. And these five features, as you will observe, these, will, these are all extracted from this set of mantras only. These seven, eight mantras, which we are going to do in detail, you will find that that five features is basically a summary extract from these, these verses. And Yamaraj is defining the Atma. What is the aim? The aim, the objective of this, this kind of a study is what? to shift our identification from the body-mind-sense complex to the Atman. So today's statement which we make after some amount of, in fact, the statement you first make when you start to study is that I am the body. Then you refine it and say I am the mind. Then you refine it more and say I am the body with the Atman. And now you have to say that I am not even that. I am the Atman who is enlivening a body. So this kind of you know, assimilation is called Nididhyasana. And this kind of Nididhyasana means that you are renouncing Ahankara, the ego. You are renouncing Mamakara also. Ahankara, Mamakara, Tyagaha. Renunciation of the I sense and the I and mind. These are both renounced through this kind of assimilation. And Yamraj presents the features of this, of this Atma. So first is na jayate, mriyate, va vipaschite. Okay. So Shankara defines vipaschit as visheshena pasyan iti vipaschite. Visheshena pasyan, that which witnesses the mind. So visheshena normally means specifically or specially. But here you have to, you have to take visheshena as changelessly. So that principle which witnesses the mind changelessly without in itself undergoing a change, that iti vipaschitaha. That is called vipaschitaha. So he is saying that this arkshi, it illumines the mind but does not itself change. The witnessing itself of the mind by this arkshi, it makes the mind sentient. And without the Atma, without the Sakshi, the mind cannot become sentient. So there are two levels in which the world is experienced by the, by the Jiva. Well, the first level is the mind comes in contact with the world, with the objects of the world and illuminates them. So the question you ask is how can the mind, which is inert, illumine the world? So there you say this is the Preliminary phase where the Sakshi itself illumines the mind. So the point is when the Sakshi witnesses the mind, that act of witnessing itself makes the mind sentient. Just like when the mirror, when the sun shines into the mirror, the very fact of the sun shining into the mirror converts the mirror also into a secondary source of light. 
and the, therefore sakshi which is the primary source of consciousness when it witnesses the mind which is inert which is the rf which is the reflecting medium that contact of the original consciousness with the reflecting medium itself converts the reflecting medium into a sentient as if sentient entity which we call the reflected consciousness and so atma therefore is said to witness everything i the atma directly experience the body and the mind and then through this body and the mind i experience the world therefore directly or indirectly i the atma am the seer of everything but remember the shastram says that in the act of seeing like when the mind sees let us say an apple what is the shastric definition of the apple being seen the apple thought the apple vritti is born and shastra therefore says that for every vritti there is a drishta a seer so if you are seeing an apple there is an apple vritti apple thought is there and corresponding to that apple thought there is a apple seer if you are now seeing a orange that apple thought is replaced by the orange thought and therefore now the seer is an orange seer similarly with every object that is seen with every changing object the seer the mind is also supposed to undergo change that is the first thing we should understand that every time the mind sees something new the mind undergoes a change the mind which is seeing apple is the seer of the apple the mind seer of the apple mind seer of the orange mind seer of the grapes and so on so this mind is constantly changing and the difference in the sec- first level is that atma is also constantly witnessing the mind but in the action of the mind in seeing the apple there is an effort the mind focuses on the apple right so to say there is a there is will involved will power involved and when you focus on a orange you exercise that will power and you foc- and you re- drop the orange and you go to the apple you drop the apple you go to the grapes so with every exercise of will power the mind itself changes and therefore where the connection of the world and the mind is there with every changing object the mind is supposed to change and therefore you have a changing seer and changing objects but at the first level where atma is said to see the mind there is no conscious action of the atma in seeing the mind just like there is no conscious volition on the part of the sun in illuminating the mirror the mirror gets illuminated simply because it is the nature of the sun to provide illumination anything in contact with any mirror in contact with the sun will get illuminated similarly any mind in contact with the atma will get illuminated and therefore atma has no volition over there he doesn't atma has no will to play in the fact that the mind is being witnessed and therefore atma is supposed to be changeless so there is one changeless seer which witnesses the witnesses the mind and the changing mind which witnesses the changing objects the universe and that's why he says here visheshana visheshana pashyat without undergoing any change the atma does not undergo any change at all and still it witnesses the mind and as i mentioned by the very act of observing the mind without any change the atma is observing the mind experiencing the mind by that very action of changelessly experiencing the mind i the atma lend consciousness to the mind just like my image appears in the mirror simply because i am present i don't have to do anything extra for my marriage for my image to appear in the mirror i just have to be there similarly by my being there 
island consciousness to the consciousness to the mind and this such a chaitanyam such a consciousness principle is called vipachit anu experiences and lends consciousness having said that the next is na jayate such a consciousness such an atma is never born at any time and na bhuva kashchit the technical aspect it does not become anything else because whenever something becomes anything else there is a change in that original something and such a change is being ruled out by the shloka by the mantra even the process of becoming in any process of becoming there is the death of the original and the birth of the new when water converts into steam under the action of heat there is the death of the water and the birth of the steam when the caterpillar becomes a butterfly the caterpillar dies the butterfly is born and he wants to wants to say that in the case of atma there is no such change and therefore this atma na jayate is not born it is eternal it is nityam eternal atless it is shashvatam there is no decay at all so shashvatam actually negates one of the shad vikara the six vikaras which is apakshya apakshya rahitam not subject to apakshya not subject to decay is what is meant by shashvatam shashvata ayam this atma is shashvatam not subject to decay and shankara writes over here kutashchita means karana antarat na ayam atma kutashchita na bhavuvah shankara translates karana antarat from any other cause this atma did not come into being from any other cause so there can be different types of causes right something can be born of itself something can be born of something else and something can give birth to something else so here he is ruling out three possibilities he is saying atma cannot be born from itself secondly it cannot be born from another atma why because there is only one atma and obviously it cannot be born out of anatma because anatma is finite atma is infinite and therefore here he is saying that that atma is not a cause at all that is why he says i am atma kutashchita na babhuva is not born from any other cause at all therefore it is not a product because it is not born from anything it is not a product and then he says from that atma something else did not originate right i am kutashchita na babhuva kashchita it was not born from anything else nor from the atma is anything born and shankara again says an arthantara bhutah other than the atma from any other entity other than the atma this atma did not originate which means atma did not produce anything else any entity arthantara bhutah na babuvah arthantara bhutah means other than the atma which means anatma na babuvah so from that atma itself no anatma has originated so two things are being said one is that this atma was not born out of anything therefore the atma is not a karyam it is not a product second thing is from that atma nothing was born therefore it is not a karanam it is not a cause this atma is neither a cause nor a product it is neither a karanam nor a karyam and the technically we say karya karana vilakshana chaitanyam karya karanam is product and cause vilakshanam different so karya karana vilakshana chaitanyam this cause this consciousness is different from both product and cause why do we say all this because any product the body mind sense complex 
can never be free from problems. And if you want to be free from problems, you can neither claim yourself as a cause nor can you claim yourself as a product. The only solution is for to claim the Atma as myself. Then he uses the word Puranaha, which we, which we saw meant that ever fresh. Vriddhi so, Rahita. It does not, it indicates that there is no growth at all. It does not grow. Obviously, it does not grow old and therefore it is ever fresh. And na hanyate hanyamane harire. Literally, hanyate means getting destroyed. So, na hanyate, the atma is not destroyed. Hanyamane harire, when the body is destroyed. That's a literal meaning. But here, Ankara says, na hanyate has to be taken as na hinsyate. So, hinsyate means not hurt or wounded. So instead of taking Hanyate as killed, he takes it as not hurt or wounded. Why does Shankara take this meaning? The straightforward meaning is not killed. Why would Shankara take this meaning? We need to exercise our intellect a bit, the Upanishad. Because uh, namriyate comes, which means death. And Excellent. so, we can't have the same So, namriyate is already there, which means does not die. And therefore, if you take nahanyate as does not die, what is the problem? That repetition. Repetition. So repetition. Punarukti dosha. The defect of repetition, which is not there, not supposed to be there in a scripture. And that's why Shankara takes na hanyate as na hinsyate, not wounded. And not wounded can be taken here as not undergoing any changes. And that added with Shashvatoyam has to be taken as the negation of all the Shadvikara, of all the six modifications which we studied in Tatumboda, they are all negated here. The Atma is not subject to any of those six modifications at all. Now we look at the 19th verse. All very, very profound verses. So please continue to think about them. Any problem you can ask. So we'll, we'll chant. Hanta chen manyate hantum. Hanta chen manyate hantum. chen manyate hatam. Again, you can see the resemblance between the Bhagavad Gita verse of the second chapter. So we'll not go over that, but I'm sure you all remember. So he says Chet. Where is Chet? In this first line. Chen Manyate. Okay, so when you break it up, it becomes Chet. Chet Manyate. So Chet, if, if, Hanta Manyate. So you're breaking that Hanta, Chet Manyate. Chet, Hanta Manyate. If the killer thinks, so Hanta is the one who kills. Chet Hanta Manyate. If the killer thinks, Hantum, that the Atma kills, and Chet Hataha. And if the one who is being killed thinks, Manyate Hatam, thinks that the Atma is killed. Essentially, since we are the Atma, you have to retranslate that as if I think that I am killing or if I am being killed and I think that I am being killed. Ubhav tau, both of them. Who, the one who is killing and the one who is being killed. Ubhav tau na vijani taha. Both of them do not know. What do they not know? I am na hanti na hanyate. Na I am is I am na hanti na hanyate. This Atma does not kill and is not killed also. Cannot be killed. So again, 
It is the same sloka which is borrowed by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. It's a very important sloka. It points out that I, the Atma, am not a killer. And neither am I being killed. Which means I am not karta. I don't do any action. Nor am I a bhokta. I am not the experiencer of any action. So I am not the doer of any good actions. I am not the doer of any bad actions. And therefore I do not generate punya and papa phala. Why is it important? Because if I am a karta now, then the law of karma provides that I will become a bhokta later on. So karma is never a problem, right? You, everybody loves doing karma. But the, being the bhokta is the problem because the experiences can be either pleasant or unpleasant. And we don't like unpleasant experiences. So if you want to avoid those unpleasant experiences in life, you cannot be a karta. You have control over not being a karta, but not more being a bhokta. Once you are a karta, bhokta is a given. And once you are a karta, you do not know what karma phalam will hit me at what time. And therefore, you are constantly worried, constantly anxious. Therefore, we say that life, our life, is a constant battle with that invisible karma phalam. I don't see the karma phalam, but that karma phalam sees me very well. So karma sees the karta, but the karta cannot see the karma. And this is the symbolism in Ramayana. What is symbolism in Ramayana? Somebody chasing somebody. Do you remember? Vali chasing Sugriva. Vali and Sugriva. So what is Vali and what is Sugriva? Told you Vali is the karma phalam and Sugriva the karma. Yeah, Sugriva is the karta and Vali is the karma phalam. And as long as Sugriva is the karta, Vali will keep chasing Sugriva. And where is Sugriva safe? There is only one mountain where he is safe, one cave where he is safe. What is the name of that? All very profound little little things found in the Puranas, in the Ramayana. It's called Rishimokaha. The face of the Rishi or the mouth of the Rishi. And why is it called Rishimokaha? Because from the mouth of the Rishi, what comes out? Atma Jnanam comes out. And therefore, where so Rishimokaha is the understanding of the Atma. So only once you have understood the Atma as yourself, then only that Vali will stop chasing you. And so Vedanta is saying, as long as you think you are a karta, this vali karma palam will never, never stop chasing you. The only way is to take refuge in Rishimukha, in the Atma Jnana. Therefore, I have to come to scripture, I have to come to shastram, I have to learn, I have to discover that I am not the karta, I am the akarta, abhokta, atma. So he says, Ubhav tauna vijanitaha. The one who thinks is a killer or the killed. In other words, the karta or the bhokta. One who thinks I am the karta or who thinks that I am the bhokta. Both are ignorant. Na vijanitaha. They do not know their higher nature. Higher nature is what? Atma is akarta and atma is abhokta. So Yamaraja is revealing some very important characteristics of, you can say, of mind. I, the Atma. I, the Chaitanya. What are they? The first one is Nirvikaraha. Nirvikara means Nirshadvikara. Devoid of the six changes which we saw in Atvabodha. What are they, the six changes? Shadvikara. Asti Jayate Mriyate. Asti jayate mriyate. Apakshiyate viparinamate. And? Vinashit. Vinashit. So these six changes, nirvikara, it does not belong to Atma. And since these changes do not belong to Atma, 
any discussion on rebirth or dying punarapi jananam punarapi mananam any discussion on this is not relevant for the atma at all since out of the shadvikaras birth and death are two jayate and vinashya birth and death are two of the shadvikaras where is the question of saving me from birth or from death when the cycle itself is absent when the birth rebirth cycle is not there where is the question of saving me from that therefore after i come to vedanta after i do a bit of assimilation of vedanta i begin to redefine samsara right what is this i say this misconception that i have this misunderstanding that i have what is the misunderstanding that i am subject to the cycle of birth and death this notion that i am subject to the cycle of birth and death that notion is a adhyasa is a superimposition is a brahma it's a not brahma is the difference between brahma and brahma right i hope you understand that what is the difference between brahma and brahma Brahm is like a wrong, incorrect yes. idea. Right. Brahm is an incorrect idea, a delusion. Brahma is Brahman. So this notion, this Brahma, this, this delusion that I am subject to the cycle of birth and death, that, that notion is called Samsara. It is an illusion in my mind. It is a misconception in my mind that I am subject to cycle of birth and death. That misconception is caused is called samsara and with this new definition of samsara there is a new definition moksha also moksha becomes simply dropping that misconception eliminating the misconception that i have a cycle of birth and death once i eliminate the misconception that i am subject to samsara what happens i discover that i have always been free that i have been a jivan mukta i am a jivan mukta and i will continue to be a jivan mukta in this life when the body is gone then i am a videha so this conclusion has to be intellectual conclusion only why because the misconception is a intellectual mistake it's a it's a delusion and what is the problem in the intellect can be connect, corrected only in the intellect and moksha is the correction of the intellectual delusion right both the delusion as well as well as, well as its correction they happen in the intellect and the intellect alone that is why we say jnana eva kaivalya only through knowledge can the misconception be removed and vedanta says that the biggest misconception is that i am subject to samsara and the entire job of these thousands and thousands of mantras of vedanta and upanishads bhagavad gita and prakrata granthas only one job is there that is to eliminate this delusion so that is the first characteristic nirvikara devoid of shadvikaras then second thing that yamaraj is telling us is atma is akarta abhav that actually flows from the understanding that atma is nirvikara right the transference of the activities or the movement of the anatma the anatma is constantly changing there is const- because of because it's maya because because of this sattva das tamas it's always in this equilibrium it's always changing but if i transfer the motions of the anatma onto myself the atma that transference gives me what kartrutva doership and bhoktrutva experiencership i become a karta and a bhokta simply because of erroneous transfer of the idea that i am doing the actions whereas actually those actions belong to the anatma and so he says nayam hanti na hanyate this hanti or the killing is a is a generalization upalakshanam for all types of karma and na hanyate again 
is a upalakshanam for all types of experiencing of karma phala. So, na hanti na hanyate, this atma does not kill and is not killed has to be translated as the atma cannot act and cannot be acted upon, cannot be the experiencer of any fruits of any action because very simple, it has not done any action and only the one who has done an action can experience the fruits. And therefore he says, Chet hanta, Chet manyate hanta hantum. If someone thinks that he is a killer and Chet manyate hatam, someone thinks he is killed, they don't know their higher nature. Certainly at the at the transactional level, which we call Vyavaharika Drashti, at the transactional level, actions will continue to happen. But even when all actions are happening, when all transactions are going on, I should constantly focus on the fact that the transactions belong to the body-mind complex and that I, the Atma, I am not a participant. What am I? I am only the superstructure. I am the Adishthana, the support. This appreciation is extremely important because by now we all know that most of the interactions in our life are beyond our control or we have very minimal control. And therefore, the understanding that I am not the one who is doing those interactions, that gives you a lot of peace. So, there is something in Sanskrit which is called Abhibhavaha. Abhibhavaha means, um, you know, uh, supposing there is something which you want to remove, but you cannot remove. You can weaken the effect of that particular something by bringing in something more powerful. Right? The, the usual example is, you know, in in, in school, you used to say, this is a small line. You draw a line, say, about eight inches long. And you say, this is a line, eight inches long. Can you make it smaller? What is the answer? Draw a bigger line. <laughs> draw a bigger line. So by bringing in something more powerful, comparatively, that the earlier thing which looked very powerful becomes less powerful. It's like these stars in the daytime. You know, stars do not go away. They are still shining in the daytime. They simply cannot be seen because the powerful light of the sun hides the faint light of the stars or the reflection from the stars. And similarly, you cannot eliminate samsara in the literal sense of the term. Why? Because the body mindset complex is there. You are experiencing, experiencing the world through the body mindset complex. So literally you cannot eliminate samsara. But the elimination is achieved by focusing on the higher plane, paramarthika satya. In the presence of the paramarthika satyam, the absolute reality, the vyavaharika satyam, the transactional plane, it fails. It becomes as good as not being there. We should recall always, karma phalam is possible when only when karma is possible. Karma is possible when only when doership, kartritvam is possible. Kartritvam is possible when when is kartritvam possible? What is the essential condition for doership? When I am a karta. Or when I think I am a yes. Sorry? Adhyasa? No. Jeevatvam. Jeevatvam is a good answer, but you need to explain why. Because of Thula Sukshma Sharira Abhimani. Excellent. So because of the fact that there is Deha Abhimanam present. The root cause is Deha Abhiman. When that Deha Abhimanam is not there, Kartritvam will not be there. If Kartritvam is not there, Karma will not be there. If karma is not there, karma phalam is not there. If karma phalam is not there, samsara is not there. It's as simple as that. This is the entire teaching of the Shastra in a nutshell. Okay. From this, we can extract one small corollary. Now, this corollary, of course, is meant for us when we are 
not gnanis, when we are in the triangular format, the Jiva Jagat Ishwara format. What do we say? In the beginning of the study, the beginning of, the, of our journey, we say, we define moksha and we say, jnanam will destroy sanchita and agami karma, but will not destroy prarabdha karma. Right? So we say, after jnanam also, the jnani will continue as jivan mukta with prarabdha karma for the body until the body falls. When the body falls, then jnani becomes videha mukta. We say all that. In the beginning stages, we have said all that. Entire Bhagavad Gita, we kept up this story. right? What is the corollary from that story? You are provisionally accepting prarabdha karma connection for a jnani. It's a very provisional definition, applicable only to a beginner student. Right? Just like you give only milk to a kid unless it is six months old, a provisional thing. It has to be dropped at a later stage. So once you move from your uh, triangular format to binary format, in binary format, who is there? You are there and Jagat is there. You are not the Jiva in binary format. The Jiva Jagat Ishwara, the Jiva has dropped. So there is only Ishwara who is you and that is the universe, the world is there. Once you are in that binary format, you are free of Kartatva. And therefore all types of karma are absent for you. So as a Jnani, it is incorrect to say that I have karma at all. I, as a Jnani, I cannot even say that I have Prarabdha karma. Why? Because any karma belongs to anatma. As a jnani, I have disowned anatma. I am saying I am not the anatma. I have to remember that I am nitya mukta. I am eternally free. I have been free. I am free. And I will continue to be free. Bodies may come. Bodies may go. All the prarabdha belongs to these bodies only. And this is the revised definition of moksha. From saying that Jnanam will destroy Sanjita and Agami and leave Prarabdha, I will re revise the definition and say, I am Muktaha, I have been Muktaha, I will always be Muktaha. Why should I bother about the problems of Anatma? Why should I bother about Punyam, Papam, Rebirth? I am not supposed to bother at all. Jivan Mukti and Videha Mukti are provisional definitions from the triangular format, from the anatma standpoint only. From the standpoint of the binary format, these definitions have no meaning at all. Okay. So, any questions so far? You are seeing the full impact of the essence of Vedanta right now. Starts from here, basically. Oh, much. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so uh, that uh, I've been thinking of asking this. Uh, where is where does that line come from? The Jnana Eva Kaivalyam. Uh, where is it shown? It's another operation. It's not here. Yeah. Oh, we'll okay. come across that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? No. So uh, Om Raviji, in, uh, yes, we please. understand that the Jeevan Mukta is uh, yet to complete his Prarabdha before he gets Videha Mukti. Uh, that's what till today, uh, uh, till uh, to this thing. So how do we explain that, that once we are in the binary format, there is no question of the body and the Kartritam. That's why there is no question of Jeevan Mukta and then Videha Mukti. Yes, there is no question at all. As a jnani, you cannot even say I am a jnani. Why can't you say I am a jnani? Which is why we say, Adha. you know, any teacher who tells you that he is a jnani is not really mm -hmm. a jnani. Why? That, there is another comparison or the another. The moment you say I am a jnani, you are bringing in the agnani. Yeah. And that is why words fail. Because words are basically expressions of duality only. When you say good, you have brought in bad. When you say atma, you have brought in anatma. When you say brahman, you have brought in non-brahman. Words cannot be used at all. 
at the paramarthika level there is only existence nothing else thank you okay now we'll lose one more last verse before going for today so let's chant the 20th mantra mantra anoraniyan mahato mahiyan ಶೋಕ ಧಾತು ಪ್ರಸಾದ ಮಹಿಮಾನ So he says, Atma, this Atma is Aniyan Ano, is smaller than the smallest atom. At the same time, he says, Mahiyan Mahataha, is bigger than the biggest. So Atma, Aniyan Ano, Mahiyan Mahataha. So that is there in the first two words, if you break them up properly. Atma is smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. And that Atma, Nihitaha, is located Guhayam. So in the cave of your heart. Guha is basically referred to as the space in the heart. Cave of the heart. So it can be taken as the heart itself. So Nihitaha Guhayam, the Atma is located in the heart. Of what? Asya Janto. Janto is, is Jantu. Jantu is that which is born. So, Asya Janto, of this being, literally of that which exists, of that being which is living. So, this Atma is located in the heart of the living being and Akratu, so that would be careful. Tam Akratu is Tam plus Akratu, second line, first word. Akratu means the one who is free of desire, the one who is Akamaha, free of desire. Pashyati, he sees. What does he see? Tam Mahimanam. Tam. The glory of that Atma he sees. Tam Mahimanam Atmanaha. That glory of the Atma. How does he see? Vita Shokaha. When? Vita Shoka means free of grief. Shoka is grief. Vita means grief. Free of grief. Vita Shokaha. Free of grief. Dhatu Prasadan. When the Dhatus, when the Indriyas become serene. When the Indriyas become serene, free of disturbances. Okay, so we'll need a bit of explanation on that. So it's a very, very important mantra. In, in fact, one should memorize this mantra because it contains the entire four, you know, that four uh, topics we talked about. Atma Swarupa, Atma Swarupa Jnanam, Atma Swarupa Jnana Sadhanam, Atma Swarupa Jnana Phalam, all are compressed into this one very, very powerful mantra. So, Mundaka, you remember we said, Eka Sara Nitya Satya Atma. That entire thing is compressed here. So, he says, first he talks about Atma Swarupa. Anoraniyan Mahato Mahiyan. So, Atma Anoho Aniyan. Atma alone is appearing in the form of the smallest atom. Or even the smallest subatom, subatom, subatomic part, particle, or or particle. The atom, atma alone is appearing in the form of the smallest subatomic particle. Anything in the world, smallest of the smallest, object, object of the universe, is the atma alone. How? When you say atma is appearing as the smallest atom or the smallest particle, that micro universe of quantum physics contains thousands of subatomic particles, smaller than the atom itself. When you say the Atma is appearing as that, it means it is the Atma, but having taken on or having been associated with the name and form of that small particle. Right? So anything which you which you say Atma is, and if that is relating to the world you have to automatically associate it with the Nama Rupa, the name and form of the concerned particle. So, Atma is the 
is the same atma appears as the smallest particle mahato mahiyan that same atma appears as the biggest galaxy or even you know the dark holes which are supposed to be thousands of light years in diameter so the biggest known objects in the universe is also atma so the micro universe of quantum physics and the macro universe of cosmology nothing but the atma alone and this is this is the atma swarupa so the first thing is what is the nature of the atma it appears as everything in the universe smallest and biggest that is the atma swarupa the nature of the atma and shankara explains very crisply yat vastu loke asti you understand yat vastu loke asti what does it mean there in all beings yat vastu any object loke asti which exists in this world then he says anuva mahataha whether it be small or whether it be big tattaha te atmavat sambhavati it enjoys existence any object in this world any object means any object which is existing in the world and anu anu mahatva either big or small it enjoys existence atmavat so atmavat has to be taken as satta existing only because of nityena atmanah only because of the eternal atma and shankara further says very very beautifully analyzed if if you separate any object from the atma he says satta will go away its existence will go away so any object separated from atma ceases to exist this is explanation of brahma satyam jagat mithya when you remove jagan from brahman it simply is not there at all so this is the part of the swarupam the atma swarupa the second portion about atma swarupa gnana so the instruments which we have your eyes telescopes microscopes whatever they are designed to see the name the form only and of course we give it a name so we can say that they are designed to see the name and form only which is called the shadvikara amsha the form because the name and forms only are subject to six changes shadvikara i know in any instrument which we have designed can see only those objects which are subject to change so any object has two portions shadvikara nirvikar so shadvikara amsha nirvikara amsha drik drishya viveka somebody mentioned that a bit earlier five pieces are there what are they asti bhati asti bhati priyam ichai nama rupa five are there asti bhati priyam is what the nirvikara amsha consciousness existence ananda that is the nirvikara portion and other two portions are nama rupa they are the shadvikara amsha they are the changeable portions subject to change so any instrument which you have designed has designed has been designed only to reveal the changeable portions the nirvikara amsha that changeless portion of any object cannot be seen with any instrument and that is why any research any searching any journey leads you from you from one nama rupa to another nama rupa it can never lead you from nama rupa to consciousness there is no bridge connecting the anatma and the atma any research can go only from one atma one anatma to another anatma the atma portion you can only infer and therefore he says janto guhaya nihitah that atma is hidden in the mind of this jantu literally jantu means animal a living being so in that mind where this atma is hidden 
there are two factors always in any mind there are always two factors one is a variable factor all the vrittis all the thoughts all the emotions and the other is the non variable factor satchitananda right so you have two things in any mind satchitananda plus nama roopa asti bhati priyam roopam nama roopa amshakam same thing so you have three things satchitananda which are the non variable factor and you have the nama roopa the thoughts and emotions which are the variable factor this non variable factor this consciousness is there all the time even when the variable factor nama roopa has gone how do we know when there are no thoughts in the mind this absence of thoughts is recognized by us how by that non variable consciousness for the non variable amsha which is consciousness that which is my real nature because of that i recognize that there were no thoughts during this period and that non variable consciousness says rama yamaraj has to be recognized as i myself that non variable consciousness which is present among all the distracting variable thoughts among all the raga among all the dvesha among all the kama krodha lobha matsaryam among all these thoughts remember always that there is a non variable atma present that atma has to be recognized and that recognizing of that atma recognizing of the non changeable in the middle of all changes recognizing of the indestructible in the middle of all destructibles that is called atma gyan so atma swarupa gyan that is second part of it then comes the third part atma swarupa gyan sadhana so he says tam tam akrutah pasyati veeta shokah tam that atmanam that consciousness can be inferred how shankara adds darshana shravana manana vijnana lingam lingam is the indicator so he says because of the indicators of darshanam shravanam mananam and vijnanam because of these activities these activities are what lingam uh, a indicator for sentiency of the atma for the presence of the atma what does the presence of the atma indicate sentience therefore darshana seeing shravana hearing manana thinking vijnana understanding if you are doing any of these activities which we are doing all the time you have to understand that these are the lingam for the atma is a lingam from the presence of the atma and who is able to understand this akratu who akratu who shankara defines as akamaha akamaha means without desire and he gives a compound sanskrit word so i will read it out to and we'll see how to akamaha is equal to drishta drishta mahya vishaya uparata buddhi okay now in these big words what you do is you start from the right hand side like urdu so uparata buddhi what does it mean uparati you know so uparata buddhi he means what what is uparati uparati uparama withdrawn withdrawn uparata buddhi is withdrawn intellect from what bahya vishaya external objects which are what drishta adrishta so an intellect which is withdrawn from external objects which may be drishta which may be visible which may be adrishta which may not be visible so this again you remember from tatva bodha that there, is, there are objects in this loka and objects in the other loka so he is saying that one should be withdrawn one's intellect should be withdrawn from both these that kind of a person whose intellect 
has withdrawn from external objects as well as otherworldly objects, that person is a kamaha. He is a person who is got vairagya. And if you remember, that is the same definition given in other words. Words used were different in Tattvabodha. What were the words used in Tattvabodha for vairagyam? You have to remember. Without that, anybody? I'm sure Beda remembers, but we'll not ask her. Anybody else? Exactly. So the same thing I say. Iha is here. Amutra is Paraloka. So that instead of that, he has said Drishta Adrishta. So Drishta Adrishta Bahya Vishaya means the objects of this world, Iha Loka, Amutra objects, Paraloka Vishaya. Both from both these, your intellect will be drawn. That is called Akrutuhu Akabaha. So we know that the mind is subject to three types of changes, right? What are they? Sattvika thoughts, Rajasika thoughts, and Tamasika thoughts. Yeah. And Sattvika thoughts come to us occasionally, in spite of our best efforts not to have them. And similarly, Rajasika thoughts also come to us. Tamasika thoughts also come to us. And here he's pointing out, Atma is not subject to any of this. And therefore, Shankara uses the word Sarvatmaka. Appearing in the form of everything. Sarvatmaka, the technical word in Sanskrit, in, in our uh, Shastra literature, which means Sarva Atmaka. So here Atmaka means in the form of. Sarvatmaka, Atma appears alone, Atma alone appears, Sarvatmaka, in the form of everything in the world, from the smallest to the biggest object. And therefore, Sarvam Atmaya, Atma Mayam Jagat. Atma alone is in the form of the smallest Nama Rupa and the biggest Nama Rupa. And Akrutaha, this person, Akamaha, who has gone beyond desires for these things. Why? Because he understood that to address any Kama, you need attention, time and effort to fulfill the Kama. Kamas are many. The mind is only one. And every time you use the mind to fulfill some desire, some capacity of the of the mind is used up. And if and we all have multiple desires, multiple karmas. Therefore, the amount of attention available for addressing or fulfilling any one desire is limited. And if among all those desires, Atma is one of those goals, how much effort can I really put forth? That is why the desire for moksha has to be gradually moved up in my priority list. Just like the one who wants to say, win the Wimbledon, will slowly, slowly have to renounce most of his desires and spend time, the majority of his time, on practice. Similarly, the one who wants moksha will have to be giving up most of his desires and focusing on the commitment to moksha. And the only way to reach this stage the only way to really drop these desires is to understand the emptiness of all these material accomplishments. And in that, Karma Yoga helps us discover Vairagyam and Mumukshutva. I won't explain the terms. They are both there in Tathabodha. Vairagyam and Mumukshutva. Then the next qualification is Dhatu Prasada Vita Shokaha. So Dhatu here means the various Indriyas. So the Jnana Indriyas, Karma Indriyas, Antakarnaha, these are Dhatus. Prasada means grace, by the grace of. Then Dhatu Prasada means by the grace of my organs, of my Indriyas. Which means what? Is the Indriyas must be available to me for spiritual study. Which means what? I must have disciplined them. Which means we come back to Samadhi, Shat Sampati. Thus, Dhatu Prasada Vita Shokaha indicates Samadhi Shat Sampatihi indicates a person who knows the value of moksha. And such a person, Mahivanam Atmanaha, the glory of the Atma is recognized by such a person. And that's why Krishna said in the 10th chapter, Aham Atma Gudakesha 
Sarva Bhuta Shastataha. He starts with the first glory that I am the consciousness itself present everywhere. And the last topic we said was Jnana Phalam. So he says Vita Shokaha Bhavat. In the Dhatu Prasada, they indicates the qualifications of the person, the Samadhi, Chat Sampati Sampanna person. And the last word, Vita Shokaha, it is the Jnana Phalam. Vita Shokaha means he is free from Shoka. He is free from sorrow. And therefore, we have to add he is free from Raga and Moha also. Why? Because, as I said, the mind has three fluctuating conditions. Sattvika, Rajasika and Tamasika. But the Jnani is the one who has disowned that mind itself. By disowning the mind, he has transcended the condition of the mind, which Krishna refers to in the 14th chapter as Guna Atitaha. So the Jnani hands over the mind to whom? To Vishwarupa Ishwara. And after that, he is free of desires, he is free to assimilate, he is free from sorrow also. So with this, I'll stop. Any questions, please? Okay. Are we going too fast or too slow? Or do you require more explanation? Any feedback is welcome. Good. Just need a lot of mana now. Yeah, Pananam is absolutely necessary, of course. I think it's okay, Raviji. All right. Thank you, Nataraji. Okay, then. With that will stop for today. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnamad Purnamadachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnam Eva Vashate Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat Om Namashivaya Thank you for your patience Thank you Acharya Thank you so much